I got to give you a little talking points. Um, anyway, so I, uh, I'm the Cotton Specialist in Mississippi State. Um, why I'll make comments as you see fit. You've been doing irrigation work a long time, a lot longer than I have. Uh, I got a couple of graduate students doing some irrigation work. We play a little bit. Um, you know, worked with Lyle down at Bernie's and some other places. Uh, we were laughing kind of beforehand. About the time you think you got it figured out, Cotton will teach you you don't have any of it figured out every time. I mean, I think I got it figured out. I'll do a, an on farm trial, irrigated dry land. My dry land out yields my irrigated. I don't know. Every time I think I got it, I don't. But. I'm just going to tell you a couple of thoughts that I got. I put that in there just because of WWF. Everybody thinks like Dr. Des, Steve Williams, or Stone Cold Steve Austin, but it's the World Wildlife Fund. It, it talks about water use in, in the industrialized nations by crop. And if you look at that, where are we sitting in cotton? We're number two. And if you think with all the people that are coming onto this planet every day, they're not going to start shooting at ag water. But you better think again. I mean, Bernie talked about all their, you know, their proposed restrictions in the Delta, we don't meet certain goals and all that stuff, and we're seeing them already. Um, I guess the first thing I'll tell you, you know, if you're thinking about water and cotton, it, it starts way before you start rolling your pipe out, in my opinion. Uh, for me, it starts with varieties, and there's a reason I show that. So if you look at this, we do all kinds of on-farm variety trials out of my shop. We ran 23 large plot ones is where I walk onto y'all's farm. You got a 12 row planter, I load it up with seed, make 12 rows down, 12 rows back, suck it out, start over. 23 of them. We spend a lot of time on the road doing that stuff. But if you take all that data, it gives you real world data. It gives data off people like Bernie Jordan's farm, where we work with Tucker Miller in the back, off the farms these guys are on. What do we do? We plant it, I walk away. They manage it all year. I come at the end of the year at the way trailer. God forbid I got to keep pulling a bowl buggy around. I'm hoping I don't have to pull one no more. It, uh, if you want to see fuel, a fuel gauge, go down in the truck, pull a bowl buggy behind it. I got fuel four times in one day, and the university called Angus because I was using his truck and cut his fuel car off because they thought somebody stole it. And, it's, and it was on a Sunday, you know, as I was going to see Kendall Garraway, and I fueled up four times. Anyway, regardless, if you look at that at face value, there's a couple things that should jump out at you when you think about a variety. Well, I think we all get. Not every variety goes everywhere. And if you look, and I'm not picking on it, but it's one that highlights it pretty good, 1518 Delta Pine. I got some guys that like 1518. It's bacterial blight resistant. My guys are still in a twist over bacterial blight. They like 1518. That's my nine irrigated locations right there. Look what it did on dry land. I had a guy call me the other day. What do you think about 1518? I like 1518. I'm not going to put it dry land. I'm not going to do it. You think about that, I've done some numbers on this. You take that yield versus that yield, and you think about 70 cent cotton, $40 bale gin rebate, whatever it is, some guys get more, some guys get less. You're talking probably $170, $180 swing per acre just on that variety, putting in the wrong spot. If I walk onto Bernie's farm and tell him I can make you 180 bucks, I done sold my services. I'm going, I'm good, I'm, going, I'm getting a check going to the house. The problem with that is, that's kind of a gross measure, if you will. I can tell you I want 1518 underwater. I can tell you that. I can tell you 1646 tends to go across both. If you get it underwater, you better get about 16 ounces of picks on it when it starts putting squares, because it's going to get as big as this roof. I've seen it do it. Tucker, you've seen it too. I know you have. 444 is kind of the same way. It'll kind of go across all of it. The problem is, when you get something like a 1518 that likes to be underwater, it's a gross measure. You think about, and Jason Cruz has got some of this data, you think about a variety, there are some specific varieties, and I can't tell you what they are because they turn over so fast. A specific variety wants to be watered a certain way. Some cotton likes water up front. Some likes it in the middle, some likes it in the end. Jason's got some data to show you. Yields are pretty similar until they start watering late, they top out at the end. And the problem with that is 15, 18, I bet I see it another two years and it's gone. 1522 did really well for us. Not even putting it in my on farm trials this year, they're putting 1725 in to replace it. As good as 1522 did for us, it's already being replaced in all of our on farms, but they don't last long, even a good one. It makes it impossible for me to tell you, hey, you need to water this one a little later, you need to water a little heavier. You can't do it. You pretty much got to make a gross measure of, I want it underwater or I don't want it underwater. And I, I, 
I hate to say that because I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that wants to do it as best I can possibly do it, but there's no possible way to generate that data because anytime you start doing irrigation work, what happens? It rains all year long, or it doesn't rain all year long, then you get some good data, but you got it one year. Uh, I can tell you 2015 was a way, 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 way different year than 2016 when we tried to do a bunch of irrigation work. But anyway, I, do that, I, I, I say that just to make a point. Find a variety, pick one, but you got to start playing on irrigation ahead of time. And it starts with your variety. You'll pay the price all year if you put the wrong one in the wrong spot. I'm not going to worry about all that stuff. Most of our irrigation is furrow irrigated. Uh, now, if you go to the hills, northeast Mississippi, for those of you not from there, you see a lot of pivots going up in northeast Mississippi because of topography. Some rolling land, uh, you kind of get in that black prairie, real, some heavy clay in there. Uh, it just doesn't, it's not real conducive for furrow water. You see a little bit. Uh, but you see a lot more pivots going in. You see a lot of surface water impoundments, folks trying to get water held up that way. I got some folks put some structures in the creeks even where they can draw water out of that. And I don't think their neighbors are the happiest in the world about that, but some of that's going on. All right. I'm going to spend a minute on this. Uh, uh, Lyle, make comments if you feel necessary. But, you know, it's easy. I know Jason tells people this all the time. Hey, I want you to use a soil moisture sensor. I want you to use a surge valve if you can do it. I want you to use faucet or pipe planter. And that's and I agree with him 100% on that. But for those of you that use some of these soil moisture sensors, not all soil moisture sensors are created equal. And for me, and I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, I, grew, I didn't even grow up with cotton. I grew up in Illinois. I grew up in a county of 150,000 acres of corn and soybeans and about 6,000 people where everybody goes to deer hunt. I didn't even grow up with cotton, but I've, I've tried to figure some things out about it. I'm doing my best, Bernie, I know. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. But if you look at it, I mean, if I, so if I walk onto your farm and you've never used a soil moisture sensor and I tell you, hey, grab a watermark and you want to water at 75 kilopacks, well, what the crap does that mean? I don't know if it's 75. I don't know if it's 75 or 175. you got to understand the differences in what those sensor numbers are telling you. Lyle, the, the, a watermark will give you a way different number than some of the Syntex will, or the Decagons will. It's a volumetric thing versus a soil matrix potential kind of thing. You've got to understand that before you even use them. And there's pros and cons to all of them. Uh, essentially, if you look at the watermarks, they're looking at how hard that water is essentially pulling away from it. It's, a, it's, a, it's more of a tension kind of thing. Whereas you look at the, the volumetrics, it's more of a, an amount of water per area, if you will. Um, and there, like I said, there's pros and cons of both the volumetrics the ones I look at, Lyle, tend to be way, way more expensive. Uh, you know, you look at some of the radios on them, you're talking, what, $2,500 for some of the Syntex, if not a little bit more? They, they tend to be pretty cashy. Uh, there's some benefits to them, but you got to pay to play like anywhere else. They call it a convenience store, not a cheap store. You're going to buy a Coke, you can, you can get it cheaper somewhere else, but it's convenient. There's just a couple examples. This is one of the this is one of the Syntex we had, some stuff we did with Lyle kind of around Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, that's just one of our watermarks that we, Nick and his guys, you guys do a bunch of watermark stuff, I know. Uh, but just to give you an example of what that is, uh, there's pros and cons of them. What we tend to do, uh, when we look at some of the soil matrix stuff, our watermarks, you know, you look at what do the numbers mean, how do you get the numbers, how deep do I need to put them. You know, you can look at some of the stuff, uh, Derek Oosterhouse out of Arkansas was, was probably one of the best cotton physiologists there was, and he did a lot of stuff, just rooting and all that other stuff. We know cotton roots go really deep. We know that. But the thing is, you gotta start looking at those sensors and see where they're bumping that water from. You may have a shallow rooted crop. I mean, how many folks in the room that have messed with cotton have seen a shallow rooted crop? I have. Uh, was it 2009, we got a bunch of rain right after, right after we planted this thing. Roots didn't go down very deep, turned off dry the rest of the year. Cotton sat there with shallow roots, it happened. You got to account for stuff like that. The way we tend to do it, this is one of my graduate students' projects. Uh, we tend to we look at the depths and we start weighing them. Uh, we give them a percentage weight, if you will. So we look at our six-inch number, our 12-inch number, our 24-inch number. We go down to 36. I know some of them go 48 inches deep. We stop at 36 with these. We basically go a third, a third, a sixth, and a sixth is what we're doing on these. And then we look at the numbers, do the quick math on it. We see what our kilopascals are. Uh, we tend to water. For the most part, uh, 75 to 90 is kind of our threshold of Michael's project. And I'm going to show you some stuff out of that here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it just gives you an idea. That's kind of what you're going to see out of something like a Syntec. And there's a couple things. Wow, this is some of Chris Bush's name at Glenberg, if you remember being over there. So you're essentially looking at a, a volumetric thing. There's a couple things that I would notice about this graph. What do y'all, if y'all just look at that graph at face value, what do you notice? 
Anybody in the room, help me out. It's more fun if it's interactive. That's true. I tend to look at the other side of that coin. I'm pulling water from th about three different depths, but I'm not pulling much from below that. So you're so if you look at the, what that sensor is telling you, you're getting some down to about ten inches. You're not drawing much below that. That would raise a red flag in my mind. It did raise a red flag in my mind. Am I dealing with a hard pan up under that crop? Do I got pH issues down deep where my roots aren't going deep? I don't know, but so for some reason I'm flatlined below 10 inches. And you think about 10 inches of soil, that's a pretty finite amount of area you're dealing to suck water from, especially when it gets to be July in the Mississippi Delta and it's 50 million degrees and it hadn't rained in four weeks. That's a pretty small area to be pulling water from, in my opinion. Um, I don't know, several things you could probably take out of that. Again, you know, Hard pan's relatively easy to fix if you got the horsepower to do it. Uh, we do. We got some folks, not so much in the Delta, we got some folks that have kind of went to a minimum till kind of situation, mainly to get out from under horsepower. It's kind of biting them in the butt because they've got a hard pan and they can't bust it now. And they can't bust it in a quick manner. If you got pH issues 10 inches deep, short of turning that stuff over a lot, I'm not real sure how to tell you to fix that. I wish I had a magic ball I could tell you. I don't know. Uh, where I grew up, they used to run a mold board plow. You probably don't want to do that. In the <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> probably just probably don't want to do that if it were me. Would you um, consider a more healthy depth to be drawn water from? I'd like to see it bumping it. Lyle, well, you you can make a comment too. But I would I would like to see if I know my roots are 30, 40 inches deep. I'd like to see at least a bump somewhere at 15 to 20 inch range, a little bit something. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to draw it at just a limited space. I want to draw it as deep as I can. I mean, we think about this time of year when it's raining. We always talk about recharging that soil profile. I want to recharge more than just 10 inches. I want to recharge all of it. If I'm going to recharge all of it, I want to use as much of it as I can. But you're limited to what the soil texture yep. is in that field. That's right. And that's another thing to consider. A lot of times you'll see, depending on where you are, I can tell you some of my fields, I'll see 12 inches maybe of silt loam, and then it turns into a clay underneath of it. Uh, I see that some in the delta, and that may be some of what's going on here even. It's, if you're familiar with Greenwood, there's a bunch of oxbows around and you'll see texture change dramatically from one end to the other, let alone vertically. Was that from the alpha row or the every row? This is from uh, every other. Every other? Yes, this is from every other. So what he's talking about, we did some work looking at, do I need to be watering every row versus every other? And on, on what we did on those guys, every other was fine. Now, if you got some super, super sandy land where you don't get a lot of wicking across, you might think about that. Uh, this particular field, I don't know quite fit that. I still got some guys that do want to water every single row. And, you know, if you look at that, I mean, I, I did all the figures on pumping time and water use, and you were using it wasn't a, it wasn't a straight one and a half change going every other row to every row, but it was it was like a third or something like that. More fuel they were using, or more electricity they were using, and more water. It was a, it was a pretty substantial amount, and the yield did not pay for that at all. In this. I mean. It, yeah, potentially more runoff. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of point that out. It stands out to me, put a shot of water down, put a shot of water down there. But even there, you're not seeing that water. You know, you're six inches there. You're not seeing it much below six inches on that. You know, some of that are soils. If they're silty soils, what happens after, after, you, after you run your workman through it and get your bed, you know, your bed set back up, well, what happens get a rain? They seal over, they get tight, you don't get any water in. And we see it every day. Um, you know, surge valve. I know, I know Jason and I know Lyle. You're probably starting up some of that. A surge valve is probably a way to alleviate a little bit of that. Um, surge valve is expensive. Uh, I mean, they're, just, they're expensive to have. But anyway, just a few things I wanted to point out about that. Talking about pivots. You know, talk about. I mean, one of the big questions: Where do I stick my sensors at if I'm running a pivot? You know, I talk. You talk to Jason or, or, or Lyle. You can make these comments too. I know. We tend to like them on the outer spans. Why do you like them on the outer spans? That's water and You're also covering, if you got them on the outer spans, so you got two different sets in the field and they're on their outer spans, you probably are covering the most area on your outer spans. Think about this, what the circum, whatever it is, pi r squared. You're covering 
you got way more area covered represented by those sensors if you got them out here than if you got two right there. You know what I'm saying? But you got to think about soil texture. Again, that kind of that green wood area, burn even somewhere where you're at where those textures change tremendously. You don't want to stick one of those off in a sand blow. It's going to give you a crazy number that's not going to be representative of your field. I've seen it happen. You know, you don't want to stick it if you got a little slope to it where water's going to run off of it and not necessarily go into it. There's got to be some rhyme and reason to where you stick those sensors at when you do this. It can't just go out and, and just jam them in the ground. I guess you could with the data, they'd be probably be somewhat questionable if I had to if I had to speculate. But anyway, so look, I'm going to tell you all, I'm going to show you all a couple of, I don't like to show you all a bunch of data graphs because it's getting to be supper time. You know, if I want to go to the bar and everything else, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop you from that. I hate to stand between a man and his vices. <laughs> but anyway, I got a graduate PhD student and we're doing some work trying to figure out, okay, is there a particular critical time in cotton where we should think about watering more or less aggressively? Is there a time somewhere in that season when we do that? So it kind of be somewhat complicated to get your mind around, but just kind of go with me a little bit. We, we broke the season up into, what, into three blocks, if you will. We went from the day we dropped the seed in the ground to when we saw blooms. Basically, depending on the year, 55, 60 days, 62, something like that, depending. I mean, Johnny Jenkins will tell you all his data, cotton will bloom 63 days from the day you put the seed in the ground. I'll tell you, I've seen cotton bloom in 52. You catch, the, you catch the weather right, that seed comes up out of the ground quick, it's hot in June, I've seen cotton bloom in 52 days in Mississippi from the time you put that seed in the ground. So there's some ambiguity in there with that. Bear with me. So what our first block was emergence to bloom. Any time during that emergence to bloom period, if we hit one of these triggers, we went 50 kilopascals, 90, 130. Any time we hit those, we would trigger, okay? After first bloom, we would trigger it at 75, after that time. So we're basically trying to figure out if we're more or less aggressive from the time you put the seed in the ground to bloom, does it make an impact on yield, okay? First bloom to peak bloom, you're basically talking 60-ish days after planting to probably roughly 90. I, I typically count peak bloom three to four weeks after I see first blooms, generally. So we'll say 60 to 90 days. So prior to first bloom, we watered if we hit 75 kilopascals. After peak bloom, we watered when we hit 75 kilopascals. From first bloom to peak bloom, we triggered on three different, on, on 50, 90, 130, again, to see if we're more aggressive or less aggressive with water during that time, is it gonna hurt us on yield? And the same thing from peak bloom to first crack bowl. Basically up to first crack bowl or up to peak bloom, we watered at 75, peak bloom to crack bowl, we did it on the triggers right there. I could show you a fancy graph, I could show you all the bars for that. Long story short, there was no critical period that was any one more important than the other. I don't care if it was first bloom to peak bloom, peak bloom to crack bowl. If we got more or less aggressive, it made no difference in terms of irrigation in, this, in, in two years of work that we've done. What did make a difference is where we watered the whole year, regardless of growth stage, either 50 kilopascals, 90 or 130, compared to non-irrigated. Our 50 I wasn't quite aggressive enough. Our yields are pretty similar to where we didn't water at all. 90 tended to be the sweet spot, tends to be pretty close to the recommendations that we have. That's where that 75 to 90 kind of came from uh, earlier. 130, statistically speaking, it was pretty close to 90. Probably hurt ourselves a little bit. We, Bernie mentioned it, Lyle, you've seen it. We got some guys that tend to like the water a little too much and probably hurt ourselves. Cotton does not like wet feet in any way, shape, or form. Where we're watering too much, we're probably, we're probably penalizing ourselves in terms of yield. So, I mean, if you think about that, I'd love to tell you, hey, look, first bloom to peak bloom, get pretty aggressive, then back off. My numbers don't support that. I would tell you if you got a watermark type sensor in the ground and you hit 90 kilopascals at any point in time from the seed goes in the ground to you, the, I'm gonna say two weeks before first crack bowl, because that's what my next data is gonna tell you, I'd pull the trigger on water. If it doesn't hit that, I'm gonna let it ride. So there's the termination stuff we talked about earlier. Um, that's a little challenging to do because you're not sure when it's gonna rain or not gonna rain. I tell you in 2015, we got about two and a half inches of rain in that period in Starkville. We got about an inch and a half in Stoneville. 2016 turned out to be substantially drier. Uh, 
stayed dry for a long time. Stayed dry so long the floor tiles of my house cracked because they were moving around on the foundation. It was so dry I wouldn't pull it away from it. The beauty of having floor tiles, I guess. I don't know. I showed you all this a minute ago, but if you look at that, I mean, we cut the water off. What we did two weeks before, I thought there was going to be cracked bowls out there. I put a shot down there. Next, the next week, I watered different plots, plugged all the other holes, put a shot down it. When I got crack bowls, put a shot down it. Same for one, two, and three weeks after. If you look when I cut that water off, and again, 95% of the time, there's no difference from if I cut it off two weeks before my crack bowls show up to three weeks after they do. I kind of wish Trent was here. I'd love somebody to argue with me, Tucker. I, you know, I, I guess I ought to talk about nitrogen and Bruce Pittman to come in here, because I mean, they love to argue with me. I like to argue. But basically, you know, if you look at that, if, you're, if you are approaching crack bowl and you've got a pretty good amount of water in your soil profile, I'm tempted to roll my pipe up and go to the house. I'm tempted to go. And we got guys that are unrolling 84 miles of poly pipe. You don't wind that up in a day. It takes a little while to make that happen, you know. I don't know, unrolling that would probably depress me more than rolling it up. Rolling it up, I'd probably be in a pretty good mood, actually. But, uh, <laughs> But anyway, you think about that. Yeah, unless it rains all the time, then it's kind of a muddy mess. That's right. But anyway, you think about that. You know, if you could save yourself potentially one water at the end, and just say some of those numbers, and I think you got that at some of the Mississippi State planning buzz. You just say seven dollars an acre inch. You know, you save yourself sixteen, almost a hundred dollars, depending on how you do that. And again, you think about putting the right variety in the right spot and make a little money back. You're a little more efficient, like Bernie talked about, whether it's with your pump or your well motor or your water use, you make a little money back. Suddenly, cotton's starting to look a whole lot better than it once did. And in this day and time, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that as a victory. Um, you know, the last five years have been good to us in cotton in Mississippi. I tell you, five years in a row, we've averaged over 1,000 pounds as a state, state average. Now, I got some guys that were under that, but I got some guys that were well over that. Tucker, you and I talked, we laughed about it the other day. Guy hadn't grown cotton in 15 or 16 years, planted 1,600 acres, and averaged 1,600 pounds. I don't know, he must be living right. I don't know if he's in church every day or what, but he, he did something right. It's not going to happen every year. I wish it did. You know, part of that's genetics. No, there's no doubt in my mind. If you go back and look, when the first Roundup Readies came on the market in the mid to late 90s, what happened two or three years after that? Yields did. When Roundup Ready Flex came on the market in 04, you look at two or three years after that, yields did. You look at when the new Extend varieties and, and, and Enlist, all this stuff has come on uh, here in the last couple, two or three years, they've not dipped at all. They keep going up. If you'd have told us five years ago, for the next five years, as a state, we'll average over 1,000 pounds, nobody in my state would have took that bid. Not one person. The reason being, Prior to that time, there was one year we averaged over 1,000 pounds. That was in 2004. We averaged 1,024. 2016, we almost set a new state record for a year. We picked 1,228. Our state record is 1,232. Uh, I would argue 2009, we had well over 1,000 pound crop in the field till the rain set in and never stopped. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. My son was born November the 3rd of 2009. I remember that because I was in the delivery room and if y'all have children, you kind of can picture where I'm at. I'm fixing to watch this event happen. And I'm on the phone to my good friend Tucker Miller in the back. And we're trying to coordinate a plot harvest on November the 3rd. And my wife was in the position to have a child. And she was not the happiest camper with me being on the phone in the delivery room. Because with our first child, I walked into the delivery room on the phone with a guy. And anyway, my point being, we'd have probably some more years over 1,000 pounds had the weather done us right. 2009, we had a tremendous crop set up in the field. It was a good one. The weather blew it out of the water. It just it killed us. But genetics are some of that, but some of that is management. We're putting the right varieties in the right land. We're getting better at watering them. We're not overwatering them. Uh, we're using moisture sensors. We're seeing more surge valves coming, even though they are expensive. Pipe planter or faucet have probably made the biggest impact on our irrigation of anything we've done. If I had just, just a, a kind of a broad brush kind of statement. But with that, I'm going to tell you, if I had to give you a recommendation today on water and cotton, I would tell you water cotton at 75 to 90 kilopascals if you've got a soil moisture sensor in the ground. I would tell you to cut it off somewhere between two weeks prior to and first crack bowl, I'd roll my pipe up go to the house. 
In the middle of that time, you hit 75, pull the trigger. If you don't, I'd let it ride. Uh, pick your variety, plan your irrigation ahead of time. Do your homework on your varieties, put them in the right spot, and make them work for you. Don't put, don't put a variety, don't put a variety in a dry land field that wants to be under irrigation because you're gonna be stuck with it all year. And then you're gonna be mad because it got short and bumblebeed on you and didn't put a lot of fruit on everything else. With that, I'll take questions. If you got them, you can tell us we stunk, you can go to the bar, whatever y'all want to do. Yes, sir. How are you checking your sensors? The ones where we did the, the, the grow stage stuff, we checked in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every week, all summer long. From the time we put the seed in the ground to the time we run the picker through, we checked in three days a week. Now, I'd love to have the radios and all that where I could hit them from my desk. I don't have the radios. We're going to plug a thing into them, checking them every day. Bernie's got the radio. Every hour. Yeah, Bernie's got the radios. I'm not as fancy as he. You know what? I got student labor. I'll make them wait out there. Hey, go check them. Do what? What kind of sensors do you have? Those are watermarks. Watermarks. Yeah, we're using watermarks. Yeah, you know, and for what you know, I'll tell you, I learned the hard way putting them in. The first time I tried to put them in the soil probe, and it just—I I said a bunch of really bad words, and should probably go to church. If I had, if I had a quarter jar that when I said bad words, my kids could go to college <laughs> on after I did that. I learned quick. So I spent about 500 bucks and bought a steel gas-powered drill and a 48-inch soil auger. It's probably the best money I have ever spent in my life. It made it substantially easier when we did that. Um, uh, that was my experience. When you get zero to twelve, I was okay. Whereas in kind of some silt. When I got into the clay underneath of it, it I said a lot of bad words. At it. The, the yeah. ability to remotely monitor that's off of this an yeah. iPad or that's computer right. at home is invaluable. Yeah. Just a sidebar. I had an opportunity with Cotton Incorporated to go to uh, South America here a couple of years ago, and I was in a conference in Lima, Peru. And I was checking my irrigation, yeah. but from, from Lima, Peru, was able to send an email to my son-in-law on cranking up well yeah. from 8,000 miles yeah. away. And where we had the syntax, we had the radios on where we could do that also. <laughs> on our watermarks, on our research plots, it's about as easy to let those guys go check them. Because then if they, if they say they need a trigger, we can cut the well on right there and get the water rolling. We're never, we're never behind on that. That's part of the reason we do it where we do it. If I was on Bernie's farm, having to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday and check it, there's so many of them to check, it just, it would be a pain. It would be tough to do. If you had corn out there, you would be, see the value in it real quick in your Yeah, oh yeah, look, I grew up in Illinois. I mean, I, I used to check for corn borers. I remember getting pollen rain down all over me. I, I understand, I understand. But other questions or comments? Threats? What about subsoil? Y'all do much subsoil up there deep breaking? Y'all do it every year, every three years? Depends we, on the grower. We we break every year. That's what every we, year. Yeah. And I got every three, three years. Our land is uh, the majority of it is, is uh, kind of snakes along the Yazoo River, some sandy longer, and we we have a terrible compaction problem. Yeah. So we we either run parabolics, the old parabolics at 45 degrees, or we run paratill every year on every acre. We have uh, the zone builder run it directly down the center of the road. They, uh, you know, our root systems are really good. Yep. We have problems, like we all saying you water too much, you know, just have your root system to yep. the soil, it's salt. Yeah, and we got we do have some folks that don't like to subsoil that would like to see it, and usually I got a I tell you what I find a hard pan with I bought a, a 40 inch to find drain tiles in the mid you know where, the, where they where they got the water actually wicks to them and runs off. It's got a little point in the end. I can I can go all the way to the handle pretty easy, but if I if I get on it, go gate deep, and I got to jump on it and it pops through it, I got a hard pan. It's easy to find. You can find with a wire flag, you know, if you really want to. But I usually have that tile probe in my truck. You can find a hard pan, and we got some guys that got them. Um, even in the hills, you know, we got we got some folks kind of. I guess kind of the, the hills along the delta, if you will, some of those guys kind of went to no-till, and I don't have a big issue with no-till, but they, in my opinion, they went to it for the wrong reason. They went to it to get rid of their big horsepower tractors, and now they're no-till, and now they got a hard pan that deep, and they don't have the horsepower to break it up, and now they're stuck because they, they don't want to go pay a lease on a tractor to do it. It would make them money to break it up in the fall and catch all that water from the wintertime to set them up. But I just thought you had that, you know, start about the 10 inch, so that's the yeah. water yeah some of that where that field is that's man that, those fields around greenwood are just weird with all those oxbow lakes and stuff the, the textures just change 
from one end to the other. And, yeah. Six times. From yeah. The and so still over two. Oh yeah. Uh, so you have very low infiltration. Yeah. That's some of it too. And we, you know, we've talked about that. How, to, how do, how do you break that seal? You know, do you try to run something down it in the in the meantime to crack it open where you get some? Well, then what if it rains and seals it back over? Or what if you got some labor <laughs> issues and they come up there with something to break it up and then they rip your pipe in about four thousand pieces and you're relaying pipe? Not that we have any labor issues, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I got good labor. Don't <laughs> they just have to pick Lyle's pocket. They just went through Lyle's pocket. They got in a hurry. But uh, that, that wasn't his labor. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't his labor. That was somebody else. Okay. Labor. All right. All right. Uh, I, know, uh, on, 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 I know somebody said something about the pivots. Uh, I know you'll back me up on this. And there are a bunch of other people where if you've got the old pivots, it's got the original tips on there that came on that pivot, you need to get somebody to go get that garbage off. Because <laughs> that's why you're not penetrating those drops. You need to, you need to get a, if you're not going to go to the drops, you need to at least get the rotators where you're getting a true discharge of water out of here. And if you yeah. check, your well's probably not putting what you think out there. So, uh, yeah. I mean, we, had a, we had a guy that, you know, he was just adamant that he was putting three quarters of an inch water out. Darren works on this farm. I'm putting it out. My daddy said that set it on 35. That's He's right. putting out three quarters of an inch. Three <laughs> tenths. <laughs> we put, we, I made him go to town and get a rain gauge so he wouldn't say it was my rain gauge that was wrong. I know exactly. Three tenths is what he was putting out. We got him to roll it down, start getting up there to his three quarters. It changed. Yeah. It, it, it was his best cotton. Yeah. Well, and in the you were Nick's shown this before in the Delta. There's there tends to be the mentality I can't keep up with the pivot. Right. We got some folks that just feel like they cannot keep up with the pivot. But Nick and Nick has has shown examples. You can keep up with the pivot, but you got to manage it right. You, you know, right. you know, taking seven or eight days to make a turn may not be in your best interest. You might want to put on a little bit less, make your turn quicker, and then make another turn when you need it. You know, we. We kind of got in this mentality, hey, I'm seven days on a turn, I'm going to change all my well motor, I'm going to make another turn on seven days, I'm going to change my oil, and I'm going to do that seven times. May not be in your best, you might want to put a little bit less, catch a rain, good Lord willing, and, you, and then make another turn later. You can make two turns and put out the same amount of water, yeah. but quicker. Because, yeah. you know, like on these, these 15 tower pivots at a, at a quarter percent a day, uh, takes you seven days to get around. Uh, on day five, it's already dry where you started. It's back in dry. You know, you so you never turn it off. Yeah. Which and that gets back to tips and. Yeah, that's right. This is probably amazing how many pivots are still out there the original. Oh, you're right. It's right. amazing how many of them you go see, and one of the joints is leaking to shoot water about 40 feet in the air. I see. I take pictures of them in the summertime when I find them. But anyway. Any other questions or comments?